Jacinda Ardern, you just went to your last caucus, right? Yes. How was it? Oh, it was quite emotional, actually. You know, here's this amazing group of people that I've worked with uh, for the last five years, but in many cases, you know, the last 15. And to say goodbye, just like anyone leaving their workplace for the last time, yeah, it, was, it had sadness, but also a lot of joy as well. Yeah. Any regrets? Do you think, oh my goodness, why did I do this? Oh, the job? Not, not one. No, no regret over being here, over taking on the job in the first place. You know, are there things that I would have done differently? Of course, if you can't reflect back in that way, then you're never learning. But, you know, in terms of just taking it on, no, not at all. Yeah. I'll come back to that. I want to hear what you would have done differently because mm. I think, I think that would be really fascinating. Mm. But I just want to talk about caucus a little bit longer. Yeah, sure. There are people there today who wouldn't be there were it not for your extraordinary performance in 2020, right? I mean, you won an absolute majority. The only time that's ever happened in MMP. Mm. John Key didn't do that. Helen mm. Clark didn't do that. You did. Mm. What was that like? Do you know, um, at the time... Uh, I remember thinking this should be such an incredible moment. You know, uh, an election night has such a huge build up to it. You know, so much work has gone on. There's a sort of release that comes with having the election day itself. Um, but I observed some of the individuals around me that night and I could see something was going on, something was weighing on uh, some of my senior team. Uh, and at 7 a.m. the morning after that election night, uh, I got a call from my chief of staff. He said, I need to talk to you. Uh, and I said, well, okay, I'll just, I'll, I'll just get ready. It was quite early. He said, I'm outside your door. Uh, I let him in and he, he said, we, we have a COVID case. It came in last night, but there was nothing you could do at that time. And we were in the middle of the election, so I'm election night, so I'm here to tell you now. So, you know, for me, the weight of the job was so constant and so immediate that even in those moments of, you know, celebration, uh, the responsibility was always there. And so, yeah, I, I never lost that. I, I carried that quite heavily um, and for good reason. There was a lot at stake, yeah. Our response to your COVID management in 2020 was to return you with the majority we were just mm. talking about. Mm. And you led us in a way that was extraordinary. Mm. And a whole lot of people who've never voted Labour before, presumably mm. because you did so well, mm. voted Labour, mm. right? Mm. People in Selwyn who were National Party voters through yeah. and through, whose grandparents were National Party voters, yeah. presumably voted Labour, mm. maybe for the first and only time in their lives. Mm. Then what happened? What? Because mm. we ended up in a place of such rancour, such mm. tribal enmity, such a mm. polarised society. What happened? I think what happened wasn't, it wasn't unique to us. And I don't say that to lessen its impact or how it felt for everyone or to trivialise it. I say that because I actually think what we experienced is, uh, is beyond our borders. It's, it's not just a fractured debate that was here and it wasn't just, it won't be just one issue. Issues around vaccination was the example that we had at that time and it was incredibly difficult. It would be one of the hardest experiences I had was seeing that we had lost for a time that sense of unity, that sense of community that was incredibly difficult and I will forever think back is there a way I could have kept that cohesion is could there? I I don't know the answer to that John because there may have been but we may have lost other things um, and the other things that we may have lost would have been people because ultimately what we were trying to do is just make sure that people were safe and I kept telling myself looking out that window that's what they think they're doing too um, they heart of hearts, everyone thought they were doing the right thing by New Zealand, but it led to just a, a strongly held view, and in some cases, in some cases, built around falsehood. 
I just COVID was the example then, but there will be others. And so for me, the challenge is how do we learn from that? How do we deal with wider issues like disinformation? How do we remember that we're human and that regardless of whether we agree or disagree with one another, we are still humans and just get that sense of humanity back. Uh, I don't think that this is emblematic of New Zealand as a whole. You know, for the most part, my experience of politics has been amazing. The New Zealand people have been kind and generous, but there's a small group who hold some very extreme feelings towards me. Yeah. Do you think they were more extreme in part because you're a woman? I don't know. And it shouldn't be up to the victims of misogyny to address misogyny, right? Well, I think, look, I, I don't want to paper over the issue. I do think that we'll all benefit from some reflection on those issues. Uh, I'm wary of me being the person that, that does that because it could easily look like I'm trying to create excuses for things that I should be accountable for. So that'll be for, for others. But the strong sentiment I want New Zealanders to know is that when I look back on my five years in office, my memory isn't of being treated poorly or being attacked or feeling unsafe. My memories are of the woman who randomly from nowhere just made me a cup of tea uh, uh, at the airport. The, the people who pass notes down a plane to just encourage me to keep going. The random strangers who keep sending me flowers, even since I've left, just to tell me they appreciated me. And the screeds of letters I get from kids. Yeah, they, those are my memories. Yeah. Are you used to it unsafe? Did you feel unsafe often? No. Really? No, no. Re and look, really? I'm not naive. I mean, the people standing out there with nooses citing yeah. the Nuremberg trial. There was a picture of you disguised, altered to look like Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I and mean, look, this wasn't safe behaviour. No. Look, do, were there people who wished me harm? Yes. Did I feel like at any moment I, uh, I was um, at risk? I felt well cared for. Uh, and so, so no. Do I think, the, though, that that ex behaviour was acceptable? No, but nor would the majority of New Zealanders. Does that mean people can't disagree? Of course not. So people how, so, should be able to. So but this is the conversation. How do we have disagreement without this, this enmity? Yeah. How do, how, how do you, and I hope that in the, in the not too distant future, you and I are going to talk about policy. Yeah. Yeah. But I presume we're going to do it without resorting to character assassinations. <laughs> Indeed. You know, I'm not going to hold up a photo of Adolf Hitler. Right? So yeah. how do we preserve the right to have discourse and disagreement yeah. without hate? T two things. I think firstly we have to, the foundations of our debate have to be based on fact. You know, when I would look behind it, some of the motivation from those who might have been on the more extreme ends of what they were calling for, some of them believed that I was doing horrific things. Uh, and that, of course, then amplified how they felt in response. So I think the first thing is, you know, the, the growth of conspiracy theory, it's a, it's a dangerous and difficult thing, but we have to find a way where we know that our children who are going to face screeds of information in the future, how do they determine fact from fiction? And how do we equip with them with the skills that they need in the future? So I think the first thing is, just the foundation of those debates needs to be really grounded. And the second thing is, even when we disagree, just remembering how each other's humanity, remembering that we may disagree with one another, but the motivation behind that, so often, even in this place, is built on the right things. I want to talk about being a woman in politics. And, and you know, it's not fair to, to, to visit misogyny on you and say, how, how are you going to respond to what are you going to do about it? But equally, I was looking uh, at Vogue magazine, 12 women leaders who changed the world for better in 2020. Do you remember who was number one in that Vogue magazine list of 12 women leaders who changed the world for better in 2020? No. Come on, have a guess. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you were number one. Oh, right. okay. Thank you. And then who else was on the list? Angela Merkel. Yeah, okay. Nicola Sturgeon. Sana Marin, you, all four of you have gone or are going. Yeah. What does that say about being a 
a relatively progressive. And Angela Merkel was a bit of a mixture on the progressive front, but the mm. other three, you, the rest of you are really progressive. What does it say about being a progressive female leader in this world? Well, well for three of us, we determined, you know, when it was time for us to, to pass the baton over. And so, you know, I can't, I can't speak for, for any of those, um, those other uh, women. I can only speak to my decision making. Uh, and I remain absolutely clear and I, I really want to reinforce, I, I did not leave because I felt that I was being given too much of a hard time. That did not factor into my thinking at all. Do you promise me that? I do. I hand on heart promise you okay. that. That, did, that was not my rationale because actually when you're in politics, you know that you're going to butt up against people who disagree. One friend said to me once, if you're standing in a room and you're talking and at any given time 50% of people don't disagree with you, you're probably not saying anything. You, it's built into us to, to know that you are going to, to meet with challenge. It's as it should be. So no, that wasn't a deciding factor for me. And actually, the height of those rough periods, they were through 2020, 2022 in particular, it was getting better, but that wasn't my reason. Mm. What, what was your reason? You said nothing left in the tank. Yeah, that's my reason. That was it. I was being utterly open and honest with everyone because, you know, having done the job for five years, I knew that, you know, there's what you can plan for in your agenda and, you know, we came in with our 100 day plan, working really quickly on the challenges we identified in the 2017 election that we wanted to take head on. You know, we had this package around, uh, you know, families and supporting those in the greatest need, child poverty, and then within a short space of time, bam, domestic terror attack, volcanic eruption, a pandemic, an economic crisis. Uh, I know that to do this job well, you have to have a lot stamina and energy and then some for what you might not prepare for. Now I could keep going. Uh, I wanted to be able to finish my term because that's what I ran for, but I knew in doing that I would have to commit to another three years. And it was that three years I could not hand on heart stand up in front of New Zealanders and tell them that I had enough left. So I was honest with myself, um, but also honest with the people that elected me. Do you remember uh, we spoke at the Labour Party conference in Manukau? Yes. Mm. November of last year. Yeah. It was, I really enjoyed that interview. It felt mm. like good tennis. You were on, I mean, it was a party conference. You were surrounded by the faithful, but you seemed up for it. Yeah. And I said to you, do you still have the heart for this? And you replied, uh, and I, I want to find it here because it's a verbatim reply. Mm. I'd like to think you can see that. Yeah, and I could. Yeah, I could see that. I that came was out in of, November. So what happened? I came out of that, that. I actually, I came out of that conference feeling really rejuvenated. I got a lot of energy from the membership. Uh, then there was a very intense end of the year, and I could feel myself just waning again, which I'd felt at various points during the year. And I thought, I need to go away this summer and just see. Can I give myself that last chance to see if I can? you know, fuel my tank again, just have enough to be able to, again, as I say, commit to what then would have been four years. And over that summer, I just couldn't do it. So, yeah. I remember when you became leader in 2017, I think everyone who follows politics in this country remembers it vividly. You came out, Andrew Little had stepped aside, you became the leader unopposed, you came out. You said a really interesting thing about Andrew Little, and I wonder if it was preemptively Freudian. I want to suggest to you that it, it might have been. In my time working with Andrew, I know one thing to be true. He is first and foremost loyal to Labour. Yeah. Were you first and foremost being loyal to Labour? Did you know that if you got out of the way, Chris Hipkins could clamber back towards <laughs> the brazen and uncontroversial you know, centre that you were seen to have lost? So, you know, I've given my reasons for the decision that I made. But also sitting in the back of my mind was this question and belief that uh, perhaps my departure might bring the tempo, the heat, um, the friction that had come into politics, that it might take it down a peg. And if it did, that would be good for New Zealand. So 
I was really proud of the progress that we'd made. We did push up against some things that were difficult. We had some hard debates, but part of me did think, you know, if I go, maybe we can just take a breath because I knew I was a flashpoint for some people. Now, again, that wasn't the basis of my decision, but I hoped it would be a consequence of my decision. You said good for New Zealand. Mm. Was it good for Labour? Were you doing what Andrew Little did in Every decision I'd made, I'd hoped would be the right thing for Labour and for New Zealand. I, in the beginning, thought that an early departure would be selfish, but then my view was actually it would be selfish to stay if I know that I hadn't got it in me anymore to keep going. Uh, and then the more thought I gave it, I believed it wasn't just right for that reason as well. So, you know, when I've watched on, I've felt like, yeah, I feel like I, I was right and it was the right decision for lots of reasons, yeah. If Neve in 12 years time comes up to you and says, Mum, I want to be a politician. <laughs> what would you say to her? Go for it, darling. Would you? Because I'm never gonna trample on my girls dreams and hopes you know at the moment it's things like doctor and you know vet and yeah. and my greatest wish for my child the same as anyone is that they just do what, what gives them joy and if she thinks this would give her joy then absolutely did it give you joy it did give me joy it gave me huge joy and in fact if there's you know anything that I'd want to impart in these last opportunities that I have to do it it's that you know, New Zealanders are generous, they are kind, they are warm, they show huge empathy and gratitude. Uh, what people have debated and discussed since I left, yeah, let's have those discussions, but don't for a moment believe that was the totality of my experience, because it wasn't, yeah. You talked before about how the orthodox and conventional narratives of government in your time as Prime Minister, we're derailed by these extraordinary events, the global pandemic, you know, Fakati, White Island, and of course, March 15th, that awful, awful day. Hmm. What do you remember now looking back on it? There are a lot of very vivid memories that I have of that, uh, of that time and specific uh, events traveling to Christchurch for the first time, um, meeting first responders, but hands down, uh, those memories that are strongest for me are all the ones that involve the members of our Muslim community um, and just their incredible generosity in that totally traumatic time, uh, their generosity towards New Zealanders was just extraordinary and is, is my standout memory of the entire time. Mm. I couldn't believe it. Mm. Mm. And I wasn't dealing with them mm. to mm. the same extent that you were mm. those families. Mm. But I don't recall a single family member saying a single hateful thing to me. But also just the fact that that was so immediate, right in the wake immediately after um, the attack. That was almost this instinctive reaction to reach out back out to New Zealanders uh, was just uh, incredible and selfless and generous. How did you find the words? How did you find the words? Uh, when I uh, think back to the hours immediately after uh, the attack occurred. Uh, there were moments where I was getting bits of information and I remember being briefed on the manifesto and at that point I remember shifting from having a lot of questions over what was going on and what was happening on the ground and there were questions over whether or not it was a single attack or potentially an orchestrated set of events involving more than one person. But as more information came through, I just remember my shift in emotions. And when someone briefed me on the manifesto, I just remember feeling rage um, because it was so clear that this person had 
come to New Zealand to try and create a sense of other uh, to members of our community and I just remember feeling angry and so that's where uh, that sentiment around um, they are us that's what that was its starting point for, for me just anger mm. do you remember the line they are us do you remember mm. where it came from yeah I, I was standing um, because immediately after they took after the uh, attack had started, they spun me around and drove me to the police station because at that point they didn't know whether it was a wider event. And I was left in a police station in an office um, by myself with my press secretary who had only been a week in the job. And we were left there for what felt like a really long time. So I was just calling back to Wellington to try and find out what was going on. And after I was briefed on the existence of this manifesto, I called Grant Robertson and just said to him, please go to the office, um, take, take some notes for me and help the team write up a statement. I'll do a press conference from here. And I just sh shared sentiment, how I was feeling. Uh, he tells me that that was where I first used that phrase was on the phone. Um, and then I went back to a hotel and wrote some notes for that lone press conference, which, you know, I walked into a room that would have been double the size of this, one small table, two, maybe three camera operators. Um, but I kept the notes. Um, and you can tell from my writing that I, uh, that I was in a hurry, um, but also that information was coming in as I was writing it um, but that was that was that first press conference I have a habit of highlighting things that I want to be able to reference or speak to quickly and there's no place in New Zealand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would be as true a sentence as anything you ever said, mm, wouldn't it? Mm, mm. Have you ever said that man's name? I said I'd never say it publicly and I've worked hard to keep to that. Good. One of the things we have to do is, and you said it at the beginning of this interview, and it's a corny old line, I quote Auden all the time, that line, we must love one another or die. Mm, mm. And this is where hate leads you. And I guess, and you were going to be a special envoy, mm. right, for the Christchurch call. Mm. How do we disagree without hate? How do we disagree without 51 good, innocent New Zealanders being killed mm. by a cynical, evil, hateful man mm. and you having to write these notes? Mm. How do we prescribe that? We're mm. having conversations about freedom of speech. How do we get this stuff right? Mm. Well, we remember just that we're all humans, having the same experience of life, whether we agree or disagree with one another. Um, we first and foremost remember that we're humans. We remember what we want for our kids, how we want them to be treated, what experience of life we want them to have. We remember what we consider to be the most important values for our kids. Kindness. Why don't we expect that of our leaders and of each other? You know, we get back to basics. But then we also make sure um, that, yeah, when we debate, we debate fact. You know, not conspiracy. Um, those are some basic principles. And look, it is, it is definitely getting harder. There's lots of challenges to all of those basic things. Um, but one of the reasons I asked uh, the incoming Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, can I keep doing the work on the Christchurch call to action was because I believe so strongly uh, that there is more to be done, that we can make a positive difference, that we do need to work alongside civil society and tech companies because the vast majority of people don't want to see a proliferation of violent extremism online. If you can agree on that, then you're focused on the solutions. 
So again, I'm an optimist and I feel like I owe the community to keep going on that work too. Mm. Can I talk about your political capital? Mm. And I, I wonder if you know where I'm heading here because <laughs> you and I, I mean, you know, I had the privilege of interviewing you many, many times on breakfast and the recurring theme that, w w that we, we discussed many times was about your response to child poverty yeah. and your determination. And I guess you and I both remember, I think, an interview you gave when I was on Checkpoint at RNZ. You were driving to the Governor General's office. Oh, yeah, office. yes, 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 I do. You were in the Crown car, yes. getting to be sworn in. Giving you landmarks as I went. I'm outside KFC, John. <laughs> <laughs> and as you were outside KFC, yeah. you also said some extraordinary things. Mm. You said, I want this government to feel different. Yeah. I want people to feel that it's open, that it's listening, and that it's going to bring kindness back. Mm. I know that will sound curious, but to me, if people see they have an empathetic government, I think they will truly understand that when we're making hard calls, we're doing it with the right focus in mind. Yeah. Now, RNZ mm. listeners text in on 2101, and normally they text in to say, shut up, John, we can't stand you or whatever. That day, the text just exploded mm. with people saying, oh my goodness, mm. this is our Prime Minister. Did you deliver on that aspiration on those hopes, mm. on those promises, in the areas where it was toughest. And I believe I did, because government isn't just what you do, it's how you make people feel. And the number of times that I had um, people, including kids, come and comment to me about the way we were governing, I felt like we had done exactly what I set out to do. We did it differently. Um, you wouldn't often hear, I think, five years ago, kindness used as a trait in leadership. Uh, not often anyway, um, but now I hear it. And that's very gratifying to me. Uh, your question though, you ask about policy as well. I think when you have significant aspirations and they're on issues as significant as child poverty, inequality, climate change. If after five years you leave and say job done, then you weren't trying hard enough because in my mind, so long as in a nation as relatively wealthy as New Zealand, we have child poverty, the job is not done. Um, but I feel very proud of what we did in the time that I was here. And my hope is that governments of all stripes will keep going and we've done some things to hold them to account in the future as well. And that's the Child Poverty Reduction Act, That's right. right. And that's targets. It and is. So and yesterday, measurements and being open about what you have and haven't tr done. Tr truly. And, and in a way, like the Reserve yeah. Bank or whatever, it's really important. Yeah. And, we, and you, we, know, you won't find a country in the world that has legislation quite like ours. Right. Mm. But did you deliver on child poverty reduction? We, we lifted tens of thousands of children out of poverty. But again... Did we lift everyone out? No. And so that's why it is incomplete. But I don't regret could, could reversing those benefit cuts, which previously would have been a controversial thing to do. True. Um, and, and, indexing and to wages. We put food in schools. We created standards for rentals to make sure kids were warm and dry. We built tens of thousands of houses. You know, I feel proud of what we did. But I'll feel even prouder if New Zealand keeps going. Welfare Expert Advisory Group, 42 recommendations, none implemented in full by the oh, government. Again, again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of sometimes the fact that even the things that we did do weren't always acknowledged. That's politics, you know, but I took great heart from the fact that when I left the Child Poverty Action Group, they acknowledged the progress we'd they made. They did, and they yeah. put out a very generous statement. They now, did. Now, yeah. I called in a Sasha yesterday, and oh, yeah. I said, and. So Ellis Asher is an emeritus professor, a paediatrician, yeah. yep. a health spokesperson of the Child Poverty Action yeah. Group for many years, and she's given her adult life to yeah. raising the health amongst mm. children who live in our greatest e economic deprivation, mm. right? Mm. And she said to me, you know what I wish she'd done? And she said it really passionately, and that is the Working for Families $72.50 a week, the in-work tax credit. You know, had that gone to beneficiary families, that would have been transformative. And there is a school of thought on the left that it was mean so to not do that. What I'll take pause on, though, is that we lifted benefits by more than that for the average family on income support. We lifted it by more 
than just that $72. But if we look at the material hardship figures, which have plateaued, and they did come down, and credit yeah. where credit's due, they did come down. During an economic crisis. But in the last 12 months they've plateaued, and the cost of living increases suggest to me that they may in fact potentially go up. If we look at the material hardship figures, if we look at the number of children who are living in poverty, that is so great that from time to time their parents can't afford to pay the power bill mm. or take them to the doctor or feed them. You know, that number is still way higher than your aspiration led us to believe it would be five years into your prime ministerial ship. John, after five years, and despite having the, one of the worst economic crises, and you and I both know that when you have economic crisis, it's those on the lowest income who always bear the brunt of it. Not only did we continue to make progress on child poverty, and over 70,000 kids were lifted out of it, we also made systemic changes that will continue to support those families into the future. We had some of the lowest unemployment rates that we've had as a country, despite what we were going through then. We now have the infrastructure of food and schools to help some of our lowest income families to make sure our kids are getting a decent meal every single day. We've lifted incomes for those on benefits by on average over $170 a week. We finally reversed those benefit cuts of the 1990s and to preserve it into the future, we've indexed benefit rates against wages. There are things that I know when we walk away, we'll keep going, and that was important to me, that it wasn't a flash in the pan that was just reversible. They will keep going and they will keep making a difference. Now, if you'd said, I think to anyone uh, 10 years ago, do you think you could increase benefits by that amount? And that New Zealanders would not only accept that, but would call on you to do more. That in itself is a significant change. And so for me, it's about continuing that momentum. I'm proud of what we did. It was a short space of time, but the progress we've made was significant. And yet if we look at the, so the Salvation Army Social Policy and Parliamentary uh, Unit report, it's their fifth state of our communities report. You'll know this work. And in this case, they looked at four local communities, well, like Westgate, Batani and Blenheim. And this is what the Salvation Army says. And I know how excited the Salvation Army was about your aspiration around child poverty. In 2017, they would have been clapping and cheering at how much you hope to make a difference. And they said, home ownership is a pipe dream, rental property is unaffordable, social housing is unavailable, and homelessness is more visible in these communities. Mm. I've yeah. always made sure that, you know, I know when we have these discussions, we talk about them a lot in terms of the numbers and, and we do that because it's our job to have a snapshot of what's happening in real time and it's one of the reasons why we put into law that from now on we will use these multiple measures to fully understand poverty in this country and fully understand it for Māori children, Pacific children, children with higher disabilities. Rates. Māori and Pacific children have higher rates, don't they? They absolutely do. And, and, and that and has helped us. Demonstrably higher rates. And Isn't that, is, that a terrible thing? And we have tracked it down. And we can demonstrate that now because it wasn't even being measured properly before. But I also always wanted to make sure I had an understanding of what was going on for our community groups. I remember I'd, I'd always make a habit of going to uh, talk to people who were seeking support from City Mission at Christmas time. And I would often just take the time to talk to people who were waiting. I noticed in those last years the number who would say to me, I have housing now. And they often were in new housing, new state housing. And I'd ask them a little bit about their circumstances. And while, yes, they were seeking that extra need at that time, and we had MSD people there to make sure they were getting their entitlement, they would say, but I am at least, I am warm and dry now. And you know, what a difference that housing work was making. Again, John, all of the aspirations I had, none of them would be things you would finish in five years. They wouldn't. Do we want our politicians to stop saying this is where we can, what we can do as a nation? I might not be able to do it in three or even six years, but we should never expect less of our politicians because I worry the moment you do, they stop trying. I, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. And I don't recall doing a similar interview with John Key when mm. he stopped being Prime Minister mm. because I think he was less on the record about his aspirations.
But do we want to well, stop being aspirational? No, no, we don't. But equally, we have to be judged by our words, don't we? And by golly, your words were wonderful in 2017. And you talked about the city mission. In 2021, the city mission distributed 63,000 food parcels. In 2017, when you became Prime Minister, it was a third of that number. Mm. It's a 200% increase. Yeah. There, and I, you, yeah. You, you didn't do as well in this space. I look, and so this is where, absolutely. As you Judge me against my aspirations, but also judge me against the outcome of them. Despite an economic crisis on every market that we've used for child poverty, we have made reductions since the time I came into office. We have. Judge me on that. You know, did I leave with perfection? No. Anyone that claims that you did, I mean, again, is not being honest with you. But I hand on heart know that we did make a difference. We did. My hope is that we took New Zealanders with us as we did that, and that we will keep taking them with us. You have, as we saw in 2020, the capacity to take people with you, which is a remarkable thing. And I wonder if you could have and should have used it more around co-governance and three waters. We didn't see much of your political capital. We didn't see much of your ability to persuade people that something was worth doing in those tough and contentious areas. I don't even think people were I think lots of people don't even know what co-governance is. Wow. And I wonder if you'd sat us down and said, here's what it is, oh, this is I why tried. it's important. I tried, yeah, no, look, I'll, I'll probably, that's one of those things that I'll probably reflect back on, but also what was interesting to me is a model that has been used for a number of years, particularly around water management, was simply being replicated here, and yet uh, it was... Uh, in some ways, I, you know, look, this is not to again diminish the need to always have these debates, but in some cases it was simply mischaracterised. It was. And uh, that makes the starting point for that discussion quite difficult when people think about it as ownership, when they think about it as, you know, term it as veto rights. You then have to start the conversation with exactly what it is to then move forward. Why does it matter? Why does co-governance matter? Why do you believe in it? Yeah, let's, I think let's just step back for a moment and just ask ourselves, what is our goal? Our goal is that people can safely drink their water. Um, our goal is that our kids can safely swim in their, in their ocean. Uh, our goal is that we don't see escalating costs for people because we haven't, as politicians at Central or local level, done enough to invest. Those were the motivating factors for everything. And when you just start from scratch, designing something to do all of those things, why be afraid of having Māori at the table? Why be afraid of that? So, you know, that for me was the starting point. You know, look, we took on some hard debates and discussions. I'm proud that we did, because as a nation, we'll grow when we do. Did all of them go in exactly the same direction I expected? Absolutely not. Did you, um, did you, you know when you said, why be afraid of having Māori at the table? And I'm playing in my head, you know, I'm replaying all the conversations you and I have ever had together. I think that's the first time that I've ever heard you say that. I'm sure you've said it before, but where were you? You know, the person who could persuade us in 2020 to stay at home. Mm. The person who could persuade us that, it, that the greater good would be served if so we yeah, understood we're in the, this together. The starting point of the debate, and the one thing I'd say is that actually, whilst there was some quarters where this was a significant debate, for the most part, day to day, I did not have a number of people coming to me to raise these issues mm. day to day. And so I think when you track back, what started this in the first place? Havelock North. Havelock North started it. Work started in this area well before my time. So we're talking well about water here, right? Yeah. yeah, so well before my time this discussion started. Solutions were produced, we went through the motions of putting those in place, and then I do believe there was some politics that got into that, and really sometimes politics enhances a debate and sometimes, uh, sometimes it skews it. <laughs> and so to be honest, I mean, I found myself most of the time correcting inaccuracies about it, which is a very, again, coming back to this very hard place to start is when you're having to make sure everyone's on the same page and then debating the facts. But look, 
Does one it, thing I does won't... Does it still matter to you? Does it still matter to Labour? Does it matter to Chris Hipkins? Thank you for one thing I've pledged to myself. Having been in that job, I know how hard it is, and it's not for me now to judge anyone who's doing it. So you, you, you know, I don't. This is a pejorative term, but the policy bonfire. I mean, it looks to me like Chris Hipkins has said, Ooh, "We need to get back to the centre, and we need to do it fast. Everything controversial that we can, you know, no, let's I, do it." Do you feel that way? No, I don't. I I made the decision to leave, and. I handed over the baton to the next person uh, and all they are going to hear from me is my support, my gratitude, uh, because it's a tough job. So they'll only get my best wishes. It's not for me to judge. They're in charge now. We've had lots of your time, Hannah. I, I, want, I want to end on what you've brought with you, but just before we do that, just before we go to this, I do want to ask you about climate change and your nuclear for a moment. Mm. And, and, you know, if we look at the climate action tracker, but basically any measure, uh, to its credit, New Zealand has a target of net zero emissions by 2050. Yep. Enshrined in law. We've which is like increased the, the aspiration of our NDC. Absolutely. Under the Zero Carbon Act. But its, but it's short-term policies cannot yet keep up with this ambition. New Zealand is set to meet by far the highest proportion of its targets, two-thirds of the action required through buying international offsets compared with any other OECD country. And I think of, you know, our gross gain, our, our emissions, they really haven't gone down much since 2005. John, I am not going to let you leave New Zealand with this pessimism around climate change. The things that will make the biggest difference I, I for us. It's realism. It's not pessimism, no. is it? I, I am... You know, I'm an optimist around what is possible, and it's one of the reasons we I'm so... don't even so have methane in the ETS. What, what is, what's your reasons for optimism? One of the reasons that I have joined the Earthshot Board is because of their focus on urgent optimism. The idea that with the support of, you know, those individuals and community groups who are innovating and who are taking climate action, we can achieve our goals. But we need the urgency as much as we need the optimism. And we tried to apply that here in New Zealand. You know, you ask about uh, the emissions that we create in food production. New Zealand has one of the highest splits of our emissions profile going towards food production of anyone. All the low-hanging fruit for us is done. We are, you know, close to, close to being able to achieve, for instance, 100% renewable electricity generation. So some of our profile is harder than other countries. And that's why we are one of the only countries in the world who have said that we will price agricultural emissions because we want to demonstrate it is possible to be a world-class food producer. We already are, but we have to keep innovating. The fact that we are doing that with our food producers, that is significant. And I formed fantastic relationships with those food producers because we worked on those solutions together and that will stand us in good stead. When I glance back you know, at what we came in uh, confronted with, we had targets that we had to reach and no plan on how to reach them. Now I'm leaving, we have the Zero Carbon Act, we've increased uh, our targets for the NDC, we have an emissions reduction plan to get us there, we have carbon budgets, we have a climate commission who are supporting all our work, and we have these amazing relationships now, particularly with our food producers. We have what it takes. Do we? We absolutely because do. Because as I listen to you now, I think, wow, this is sounding plausible, this is sounding convincing. But we are not on track to reach the our 2050 thing, target. The one thing we're, not to, on we're not on track. The one thing we have within the emissions reduction plan, the ability to get there if we fulfil it. The one thing to keep in well, mind well, is some of the most significant reductions, there are lag times, which is why we have to do it now, which is why there is urgency now. Um, but I do believe it's possible. Tell me the policies that demonstrated the urgency. Uh, you don't believe that the debates that we were having around even our fleet, what we, how we get around our nation, you know, there were some, of course, who those were quite contentious standing so, up and saying to New Zealanders, we need a standard. We did not have one when we came in to say that our vehicles need to stop polluting. Uh, we need to reduce that profile down. And you'll remember some of the debate around that making sure we incentivised low emissions vehicles and created a disincentive for those that were higher. 
I refer again to pricing agricultural emissions. No one else in the world is doing that, but we, still we the are. And the ETS, the, right? Well, again, we are pricing, and that is what the ETS, of course, has a mechanism around, but we're doing it in such a way that gives the ability of individual farmers to change their behaviour in the way that ETS uh, in many ways doesn't. Will you miss this? <laughs> well, Seriously, I miss this. Yeah, truly, truly. I won't necessarily miss <laughs> I used to look at you on Monday this. mornings when you came. Was it Monday mornings you came into breakfast? I mean, usually you're in Wellington, but sometimes you come to the studio and I think, you poor <laughs> Yeah. Here I... we go again, getting up for it, getting up for it. Yeah, it was. And, you, and when your light was on, you connected with the electorate mm. in a way that 2020 tells us was remarkable. But shit, there's a, it's using a lot of battery power, isn't it? Yeah, and that's what I was honest about. It did. You know, I think probably five years felt, you know, probably more like nine, just because of what we all went through as a nation. Um, but I will, I will miss elements of it. I'll miss the people. I'll miss having a reason to go and speak with schools or to meet with people just doing incredible things. I'll miss my colleagues, our wonderful people the people I worked with. Um, I just think New Zealand is so lucky. The people who work in our public service are incredible. Um, but I won't miss the weight because it is heavy. Mm. Will you miss me asking you a question about Stuart Nash and his emails and whether they came over your desk? Well, um, you can do that, but <laughs> I'm not going to answer. Well, did they come over your Again, desk? Did you see I, The reason for me is because I'm, I'm out now. I've stepped back. It's for the new team. It's for the new team to take on the day-to-day -day and the day-to-day -day of politics. And they have my blessing and my best, best wishes. What have you arrived with? Tell me what's... Well, you wanted, you wanted to see some things that meant a lot to me. Yeah, and so what are they? What did you bring? I bought children's letters. You know, they, I said to the team when I came in, uh, I know you're going to get a lot of correspondence um, in this job, but I would like to sign out every children's letter. And uh, at the time, I'm, I'm not sure that we knew what that would look like, um, but it was phenomenal to me. I arrived at the airport yesterday and this young girl came running over to me and she said, your favourite colour is yellow. I said, yes, but how did you know that? She said, you wrote back to me. Um, and whenever a, a child that I'd meet would say, I wrote to you, I'd always say, and you got my reply. And they'd say, yep, I got my, re my reply. So that for me was important because I didn't want our children or our young people for their first experience to be of a form letter back. So uh, these, were, these were, this is a month's worth. Of, of letters from kids and some of them you that, can yeah, see. Yeah, they're from little ones. Yeah, they're from little ones. I mean, I, we, we kind of went up to sort of high school, so sometimes you get people who would write as part of a school assignment or, or something like that. Do you know tone has completely changed now? Oh. No, 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 no. You're Almost. not grilling me like no. a journalist, John. Well, well, <laughs> and, 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 and maybe... And, and I'm not grilling you like a journalist and you're not responding like a politician. Oh. Maybe this is the maybe this the symbiotic is relationship that's hard to <laughs> well a lot of it hard to I mean, switch in and out of. It. So tell me when you when you can you show me a drawing? What have you got in there? Oh, that was so you know there will be it's a rare thing, but from time to time I might draw back. Not often, <laughs> um, but uh, these are kids who have. Um, this was during 2020, so there was a lot of. COVID, you know, they'd talk about what they'd done in lockdown and look, someone here's drawn their social distancing or... Um, Whoa. But, you know... It's a slice of life. It is it? a slice oh, of God. life. But these ones I've had since, um, since I've finished and some of them are just, some of them are just lovely. You know, kids have said, this is, you're the only prime minister I've I've known, and often they're from really little children as well, and they're what lovely. That, what does that mean to you? Um, it's a great weight of responsibility knowing that no one, they haven't known anyone else because you realise that they're going to take their sense of leadership and what it is, what politics is. They're going to take that from, from you. And what will they take from you, do you think? Uh -huh. This one, my name is Leah. You've been Prime Minister for most of my life. I'm eight years old and you became Prime Minister when I was three. 
I think you are great and I'm sad you're stepping down. I'll miss you. Isn't that lovely? What do you say to Leah? Oh, I will write back, Leah, she asked. So, <laughs> but yeah, that for me is as good a measure as, as any. Mm. Speaking of pictures and letters and stuff, outside in the hallway is the portrait wall. Yeah, yeah, should we there go and do they that? Are. You know what? Outside the store, Michael Joseph Savage, right outside. Yes. You're going on that wall. He got criticised for not building enough houses either. <laughs> <laughs> You're going on that wall. Yes, yes. How do you feel about I used that? to think about that quite often actually because I'd walk down that hallway to go to the caucus room and for a while there, there was this gap in the portraits and I used to think that's where they're gonna that's where they're gonna put me uh, then they closed it up because it looked a little ominous <laughs> <laughs> um, but I yeah I did I did think about that walking down that hallway, hallway one day one day I'll be finished and the only thing that will remain is that picture and how I made people feel hmm. how did you make yourself feel <laughs> 